So this is, let me introduce my speaker. So Dr. Shatabdi Kalidas, she will speak about the ultrasound part of the pelvic floor. She is MBBS graduate from Guwahati Medical College. Now she is as a working as a senior resident in our department only. And she did her MD from the GMCs only. So next uh, MRI speaker is our Dr. Ishani Shukla. She passed her MBBS from Kolkata Medical College and Hospital. And she did MD from Guwahati Medical College. And she, will, she is now the senior resident of Guwahati Medical College. She will speak about the MRI part of the pelvis. So pelvic floor is a very difficult otherwise to evaluate without this imaging because many patients with a stress incontinence and prolapse of the or pelvic organs is better evaluated by USC and by MRI. So now I'll hand over to Dr. Shatapti Kalita to, produce, to show her presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Hello. All the best, Satabdi ma'am. Good morning, everyone. My to topic of today's presentation is role of ultrasound in imaging of the pelvic floor. Pelvic floor is a complex structure that supports pelvic organs and provides resting tone and voluntary control of urethral and anal sphincters. Pelvic floor dysfunction refers to a spectrum of functional disorders caused by impairment of the ligaments, fascia, and muscles that support the pelvic organs. Pelvic floor dysfunction affects approximately 50% of women older than 50 years worldwide. Now coming to anatomy of the pel pelvic floor, the boundaries include anteriorly, this is the pubic bone, posteriorly, this is the sacrum and the coccyx, and the ischial tuberosities lie laterally. The pelvic floor comprises three compartments in females. The anterior is the bladder and the urethra, the middle compartment is the uterus and the vagina, and the posterior compartment is the sigmoid colon, rectum, and the anal canal. A fourth virtual compartment is the cul de sac here, which is seen between the middle and the posterior compartments. In males, there are only two compartments. The anterior is the genital urinary, and posterior is the anorectal compartment. The pelvic floor is such not have any inherent shape and strength. Therefore, the fascia and ligaments that form the support structures form three layers from superior to inferior. In females, the three support structures are the endopelvic fascia, the pelvic diaphragm, and the urogenital diaphragm. The endopelvic fascia lies immediately beneath the peritoneum, and it encloses the pelvic organs and levator ana in a continuous sheet. The parts of the endopelvic fascia include, in the anterior compartment, it is the pubocervical fascia, which extends from the pubic bone to anterior vaginal valve, and the urethral ligaments, which connect the pelvic bone to the urethra which include the periurethral, paraurethral, and pubourethral ligaments. In the middle compartment, the endopelvic fascia fuse to form the paracolpium around the vagina and parametrium around the uterus, the cardinal ligament, which is the fused part of the broad ligament inferiorly, and the uterosacral ligaments. In the posterior compartment, the endopelvic fascia forms the rectovaginal septum between the posterior vaginal valve and the anterior rectal valve and the perineal body. Here we can see this is a perineal body which lies uh, close to the inferior third of the vagina in the anovaginal septum. The second one is the pelvic diaphragm, which is a muscular support layer which lies below the endo endopelvic fascia. The pelvic diaphragm is formed by the levator ani and the issue of oxygenous muscle. And the inferior most support structure is the urogenital diaphragm, which extends from the ischial tuberosity up to the perineal body. In males, the three support structures include the pelvic diaphragm, urogenital diaphragm, and superficial perineal pouch. Uh, here we can see this is the urethra anteriorly behind the pubic symphysis. The middle one, this is the sleeve shaped structure, is the vagina. And posteriorly, here we can see the rectum. It is surrounded by the pelvic diaphragm. 
get the medial most part of levator and is the pubor axillus muscle which forms a u shaped sling around the levator hiatus medial uh, lateral to it is the pubor coccygeus muscle the lateral lateral most part is the ilio coccygeus muscle and this is the ischio coccygeus muscle all these muscles together form the uh, form the pelvic diaphragm here also we can see this is the urethra vagina and the anal canal and the inferiorly we can see the urogenital diaphragm which is formed by the uh, superficial transverse perineal muscle and a connective tissue which extends from the ischial tuberosity up to the perineal body here coming to pelvic floor ultrasound the various indications include prolapse vaginal pain urinary symptoms like stress incontinence urgency voiding dysfunction and recurrent uti bowel symptoms like obstructive defecation fecal incontinence and dyspareunia the various ultrasound methods include supra pubic which we routinely do the translabial or transperineal ultrasound and introidal ultrasound coming to translabial ultrasound the patient preparation is simple and includes minimal bowel cleaning the patient is required to empty the rectum by using rectal enema up to 1 hour before the examination bladder voiding is required before the beginning of the examination patient position it is a dorsal lithotomy position with a hip flexed and abducted probe selection is the convex volumetric transducer for 2d as well as 3d volumetric ultrasound for proper hygiene the transducer is covered with a thin plastic wrap or powder free glove the probe position the probe is placed in the perineum between the labia majora for translabial or transperineal ultrasound with the smallest amount of pressure applied to enable full pelvic organ descent here we can see the probe is placed in between the labia majora and the organ anatomy will be seen upside down so this is the urethra and the bladder vagina and the uterus and posteriorly this is the anal canal and the rectum and this acute angulation is the anorectal angle here the same image this is the 2d mid sagittal image of the pelvis we obtain at first uh, at rest then we ask the patient to squeeze leading to pelvic muscle contraction and third is we ask the patient to strain that is the valsalva maneuver this is the normal 2d mid sagittal image seen on ultrasound this is the urethra longitudinally and this is the bladder which is empty here at rest this is vagina this is the uterus and this is the anal canal and this is rectum now from 2d ultrasound we can image the volumetric uh, 3d ultrasound by uh, obtaining the plane of minimal dimension it is the shortest line between the posterior surface of pubic symphysis up to the levator ani muscle this echogenic area is the pubor axillus muscle which lies behind the anorectal angle so we uh, go we obtain this plane of minimal di dimension and then 3d volume rendered image is obtained through this section here this is the sagittal plane of minimal dimension this is the coronal and this is the axial image and then we obtain the axial 3d volume rendered image we can see in this image the normal anatomy on 3d volumetric axial ultrasound is this is the urethra which is seen anteriorly the smiley shaped slit like structure this is the vagina and posteriorly here we can see the rectum this echogenic sling like structure around in the levator hiatus this is the pubor axillus muscle we measured the levator hiatus along the inner aspect of the pubor axillus muscle the skin gland which lies superior to the urethra these are synonymous with the prostate gland in males coming to pathologies of the pelvic floor pelvic organ prolapse pelvic organ prolapse is the abnormal descent of a pelvic organ through its respective hiatus the various causes include vaginal delivery multiparity obesity estrogenism hysterectomy or increased intra abdominal pressure or collagen disorders here we can see there is a normal anatomy without any pelvic organ descent uh, we obtain a line from the pubic symphysis up to the inferior coccyx and any organ that, that descends below this line we quantify it as prolapse here we can see the bladder is coming down below this line in the second image there is uterine prolapse where the uterus and the cervix is coming down and third is the rectal descent but the rectum and anal canal is coming below this pubic coccygeal line quantification in ultrasound how do we classify pelvic organ prolapse we draw a horizontal line from the inferior part of the pubic symphysis uh, which is used as a landmark against which the maximal descent at valsalva maneuvering can be measured the bladder neck or the leading edge of a cystocele is used for anterior compartment descent as we can see here there is cystocele the cervix or the pouch of the glass for central compartment descent and most caudal aspect of rectal ampulla for posterior compartment descent we quantify according to this cystocele is find is a descent of the posterior bladder wall or bladder neck of 1 cm below this pubic symphysis on ultrasound we can grade it as mild if this distance is less than 3 cm 
moderate if it is 3 to 6 centimeter and severe if it is more than 6 centimeter the cause of cystocele is tear or weakness of pubo cervical fascia or levator ani here this line it is 3 to 6 centimeter below this pubic symphysis so this is moderate cystocele on 3d axial volume rendered image as the bladder is coming down this is leading to ballooning of the levator hiatus and causing mass effect on the anus posteriorly leading to incomplete defecation here when the patient was at rest the bladder was a normal position but when he asked the patient to do valsalva maneuver here we can see the cystocele coming down below this pubic symphysis line uterine prolapse weakness of the middle compartment support structures including the pubo cervical fascia recto vaginal fascia parametrium and paracolpium results in uterine and vaginal prolapse the grading is similar to cystocele that is mild is less than 3 cm moderate 3 to 6 cm and severe more than 6 cm here we can see there is uterine prolapse lying below the pubic symphysis line which is a plane of reference and on this 3d axial volume rendered ultrasound image here we can see ballooning of levator ani ballooning of the levator hiatus along with right sided levator ani muscle evulsion can be seen which is a gap in the echogenic pubo rectalis muscle anterior rectocele it is defined as bulging of the anterior rectal valve caused by herniation of the rectal valve into the posterior vaginal valve due to weakness of the recto vaginal fascia the recto vaginal fascia lies within the posterior vaginal valve and the anterior valve of the rect normally this keeps these two structures separate if there is a weakness of the recto vaginal fascia the anterior rectal valve will bulge into the posterior vaginal valve and this depth of protrusion is used for grading which is measured perpendicular along this plane the grading is if it is mild it is less than 2 cm this perpendicular distance moderate is 2 to 4 cm and severe is more than 4 cm in this axial volume rendered image we can see this is anterior rectocele which is causing mass effect on the uterus anteriorly along with ballooning of the levator hiatus herniation of calde sac it occurs due to weakness of the recto vaginal fascia the normal position of the pouch of douglas is at the level of the posterior vaginal fornix with a variation in depth of no greater than 5 cm if there is herniation of calde sac if it contains small bubble loop we name it as anterocele if it contains sigmoid colon sigmoid colon it is sigmoidocele and if it contains tissue it is peritoneal cell here uh, when the patient was asked to do valsalva maneuver we see a loop of small bubble which is lying significantly down to this plane of reference so this is anterocele in another case we also see anterocele here which is a loop of small bubble below this plane of reference descending perineal syndrome or pelvic floor relaxation this is a different entity which is not seen as pelvic organ prolapse descending perineal syndrome is a complex condition caused by loss of pelvic organ support which result in descent of the entire pelvic floor at rest and also during straining so there is a descent of the entire pelvic floor including all the three compartments or can be isolated post and also diffuse bulging of the levator ani muscles results in an increase in the area of the pelvic hiatus so this is in an ultrasound and the mri features syndrome will be discussed later how to measure hiatal circumference hiatal dimensions are measured during the valsalva maneuver by bordering the inner limit of the pubo rectalis muscle so this is the area of the levator hiatus which is obtained from the plane of minimal dimension ballooning is the abnormal distensibility of the levator hiatus and on uh, how to measure this we draw two points from the urethra and the posterior aspect of the anus and uh, we will automatically get this levator circumference as well as this levator urethra gap is also measured here grading of hiatal ballooning this area of the levator hiatus normally it is less than 25 cm square we grade it as mild if it is 25 to 30 cm square moderate is 30 to 35 cm square marked is 35 to 40 and severe ballooning here we can see severe ballooning which is more than 40 cm square now coming to levator and i muscle integrity one special technique is a tomography with tomographic ultrasound we obtain the coronal images which are used for reference and uh, which are obtained during the contraction phase on the basis of plane of minimal dimension and from here we obtain sequential sections ultrasound image which are same to ct or mri and here we can see sequentially this is the echogenic pubo rectalis muscle and this normal image here we can see the levator ani is intact on all the sequential sections here this is the normal levator hiatus with the u shaped sling of pubo rectalis surrounding the levator hiatus it is uh, appears to be intact here whereas here we can see definite gap which is the hypoechoic area between the levator ani muscle on right side so this is right side levator ani muscle avulsion along with levator ballooning can also be seen here in another tomographic ultrasound image in the first two sections we can see the levator ani is intact 
And in the subsequent four sections on the right side here, we can see there's a hypoechoic area. So this is the left side of levator and muscle avulsion. The cause include vaginal delivery. Any cause of trauma leads to levator and muscle avulsion. The quantitative method of, quanti of quantification of levator urethra gap of uh, levator and muscle avulsion is the levator urethra gap. The minimum distance from the center of the urethra and the insertion of the most medial component of the levator and muscle, we measure this, is known as the levator urethra gap. Normally, it is little 25 millimeter. Here we can see the levator and muscle is intact here. The levator and gap, levator urethra gap of 70 millimeter. But here we can see the distance is 29 millimeter and a hypoechoic area can also be seen here. So this is left side levator and muscle avulsion. Coming to female urinary incontinence, the various parameters we use to measure stress urinary incontinence is the, the first is the bladder neck mobility. We measure it by calculating the difference between the distance from the bladder base to the inferior posterior margin of the pubic symphysis. We first measure it at rest and then in falsalva maneuver and this difference of the two values gives the numeric value of the bladder neck descent. The mean cutoff value for women with stress urinary incontinence is approximately 30 millimeter. So here, when the patient is at rest, we measure this distance from the posterior inferior aspect of pubic symphysis to the bladder base. This is the distance at rest. Then we ask the patient to do Valsalva maneuver. And again, we calculate this distance. We subtract this distance from the distance at rest. And this, if it is more than 30 millimeter, we can categorize it as stress urinary incontinence. The next is urethral funneling. It is defined if the urethral internal orifice is open during Valsalva maneuver or even at rest. Funneling is an indirect and non-specific sign of urinary incontinence, but it can also be seen in asymptomatic women or associated with urine leakage. Here in this uh, 2D transtable ultrasound image, in the, here we can see this is the urethra and this is the bladder, which is empty here. Address the internal urethral orifice. Here we can see this is closed. But when you ask the patient to do Valsalva maneuver, we can see there is opening of the internal urethral sphincter with hypoechoic area that is filled with urine. So there is urine leakage here. In another patient, also here we can see the urethra, it is closed here. And when we ask the patient to do Valsalva, the internal urethral sphincter is open, internal urethral sphincter is open. And also we can see this area is filled with fluid. This width is known as funneling width. The distance up to which it is open is known as the funneling length. Residual bladder volume. Uh, we ask the patient to do a mild Valsalva maneuver. After that, the two largest distance, which are measured perpendicular to each other, suppose X and Y, these are measured and these are multiplied. After that, the resultant measurement is multiplied by 5.9. The total value is subtracted by 14.9. And this gives a uh, quantitative measurement of the residual uh, bladder volume. If it is more, we can say the patient has stress urinary incontinence. Coming to bladder wall thickness, we measure it at three areas. The first is the trigone. The second is the anterior wall measurement. And third is the dome. We take an average of these three measurements. If the mean thickness is more than five millimeter, we can say there is detrusor overactivity and leads to overactive bladder. Urethral hypermobility. It is a functional abnormality. It is downward more than 30 degree anterior rotation of the urethral axis after an increase in the intra-abdominal pressure. It is secondary to loss of periurethral and paraurethral support and leads to stress urinary incontinence. Here, when the patient is at rest, we can say this is the urethra and this is the urethral axis. But when the patient did valsalva maneuver, we can see there is anterior 30 degree rotation of the urethral axis. So there is urethral hypermobility, which leads to stress urinary incontinence. Urethral diverticulum. Here, this is the urethra, and we can see uh, well defined hypoechoic outpouching in continuity with the anterior urethral valve. And in axial image, also, we can see this is continuous. So this is the anterior urethral diverticulum. Another case here, we can see similar approaching from the posterior urethral valve. So this is the posterior urethral diverticulum. Coming next is the anal sphincter uh, evaluation. A high frequency curved array or transvaginal probe is placed exoanally in the coronal plane. Here in this axial, uh, axial image, we can say this is the normal mucosa is hyperechoic, surrounded by ring shaped hypoechoic area. This is the internal sphincter, which is formed by continuation of the circular muscle of rectum. And this is the ecogenic externally, this is the external sphincter, which is formed by the puborectalis muscle and the, and the other external sphincter muscles. So this is the intact anal sphincter. A volume of the anal canal is acquired similar to the image that we acquired for levator ni. For anal sphincter also, we can do the tomographic ultrasound image. Here we obtain a volume of the anal canal in longitudinal pain and the axial plane is reconstructed in consecutive cuts for the tomographic ultrasound image where the integrity of the anal sphincters can be evaluated. Here in all the 
sequential uh, sections, we can see both the internal as well as the external sphincters appear intact. In this case of uh, anal injury, here we can see uh, there is a hypoechoic area in the echogenic external sphincter muscle, which is seen in sequential four sections, and it is more than 30 degree. So this is a case of injury to external anal sphincter. At least four to six sequential slices showing a defect of more than 30 degree should be required for diagnosis of significant external anal sphincter trauma. What is dyssynergic defecation or anismus? Anismus or paradoxical contraction of the puborectalis muscle it is an involuntary contraction of the striated pelvic floor musculature. It is associated with non-relaxation of the external sphincter complex and impairs normal defecation. We, uh, how to diagnose this on ultrasound? We draw a uh, horizontal line extending from the pubic symphysis up to the anorectal angle and we measure this distance. When the patient undergoes defecation, normally there is relaxation of the uh, sphincter. But here in case of paradoxical contraction, the same distance and this distance uh, during defecation will be decreased. So this is paradoxical contraction. Coming to sling evaluation, the various slings are used for treatment of uh, stress urinary incontinence types, sir. This is a retropubic uh, sling, which is seen surrounding the urethra. This is a transobturator sling, which extends from both the obturator internus muscle. Transnavial ultrasound is the best imaging modality for identifying and locating mesh implants and evaluating their functionality. These mesh implants can be seen as hyperechogenic on ultrasound images. Mid urethral placement is considered the optimal location for success. The other types include this is the tension free vaginal tip. This V shaped structure is tension free vaginal tip and this transobturator sling. The defects include here we can see the loose sling on left side. Another quantitative method is the tape gap. We measure the distance from the symphysis pubis uh, along with the uh, up to the sling. If this distance is more than 12.3 millimeter, we can say that stress urinary incontinence is present even after sling. So this is the case of sling failure. And uh, if the distance is less than 10.8 millimeter, we can see we can say that the sling is intact. Conclusion: Transnebial ultrasound can be used as a first-line imaging modality for examination of patients with mild or moderate disease, and it is very good for the anterior compartment disease and can also be used for evaluation of synthetic implants. Compared with dynamic MR imaging, transnebial ultrasound is fast and relatively simple to perform and has greater availability. Dynamic MR imaging of the pelvic floor, however, is high quality images and enable uh, functional evaluation. MR imaging should be performed in complex cases involving multi-compartmental disease and for evaluation of post-operative complications. This is a new new over 19 uh, ultrasound machine by Minray. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shatabdi, for a nice presentation. This topic is really new to us. Will we start actually really low frequency probe is volume probe is used due to 4 megahertz and your 3D reconstruction transistor. We can use some endovaginal probe also. CD clip documentation is very, very important for your all those measurements. Okay, thank you, Shatabdi. Nice presentation. Mm -hmm. I will hand over to Dr. Isamu. Yes. Uh, while Chanamam joined the session, we'll just play uh, a small video of uh, DCAT. Ma'am, uh, by that time, you can set your presentation and you can start. Uh, Nikhil, play the video for that.
the best, ma'am. A very good morning, everybody. My topic for today is pelvic floor imaging using MRI. So pelvic floor, as we already discussed, is a complex structure that supports pelvic organs and provides resting tone and voluntary uh, control of urethral and anal sphincters. Dysfunction or injury to the pelvic floor may result in debilitating disorders like pelvic organ prolapse, defecatory dysfunction, urinary incontinence, and sexual dysfunction. So the anatomy, as uh, we already know, uh, in female, there are three compartments, whereas in males, there are two compartments. And uh, the fascia in females, the endopelvic fascia from uh, superior to inferior, there's pelvic diaphragm and urogenital diaphragm, whereas in males, pelvic diaphragm, urogenital diaphragm, and superficial perineal pouch. So coming directly to the MR anatomy of the pelvic floor, uh, the endopelvic fascia is actually an extension of the transversalis fascia, and in males, it contains smooth muscles, whereas in females, it contains elastic fibers with little or no smooth muscles. So this is a coronal tituated image which uh, shows the endopelvic fascia. It actually covers the pelvic organs and the levator muscle. So here we see this line. This is the endopelvic fascia which covers the uterus, the vagina, and uh, it goes to insert into the iliopoxygous muscle. Thereafter, it continues as the arcus tendon. It continues and inserts into the arcus tendinous uh, musculi of the levator ani. Coming to delancy classification of support structures, which is important for pelvic organ prolapse. Uh, from uh, superior to inferior, the endopelvic fascia forms these levels. So level one is the superior most, which is the, parametri uh, the parametrium, uterosacral ligaments, and the cardinal ligaments. So this yellow line here, this is the level one, which covers the uterus and the upper part of the vagina. After that, this is the this dotted line, this is the uterosacral ligament. The next level, which is the level 2, is the paracolpium and the pubocervical ligaments. So this green line, this is the level 2, which uh, actually holds the posterior bladder wall and the middle part of the vagina. And the next level is the level 3, which includes the puboureteral, periureteral and paraureteral ligaments and also the perineal body. So this pink line, which uh, actually supports the lower part of the vagina and also the part of urethra, thereafter the endopelvic fascia goes to insert into the pubic bone. So coming to anterior support structures, which are the pubocervical fascia and urethral ligaments. So this, uh, these are actual tituated MR images in a female showing the urethral supports. So this is at a superior level and this, uh, this section is at the inferior level. Here we see that these are the uh, periurethral ligaments, also seen here, these arrows. And these are actually uh, extensions of the puborectalis muscle. And uh, the small arrowheads pointing here, these are the paraurethral ligaments, which actually originate from the lateral wall of the urethra. And at an inferior level, this uh, here is actually the puboureteral ligament. And also important point to note here is the vagina shape normally is edge shape. So this is important because when there is prolapse, uh, then this shape changes. And also we can see that the puborectalis muscle is closely adherent to the lateral walls of the vagina. Coming to middle support structures, which are the parametrium and the paracolpium. So in these images, this is the parametrium and here this is the paracolpium. Next, we have the cardinal ligaments or tra transverse cervical ligaments of McEnroy. So in the coronal uh, tituated MR images, we see these are the cardinal ligaments and uterosacral ligaments, which uh, hold the uterus posteriorly. So here we see these are the uterus, uh, uterosacral ligament. The uterosacral and cardinal ligaments simultaneously hold the uterus and the upper vagina in their proper over the levator plate, preventing the genital organ prolapse. Coming to posterior support structures, uh, it, in females, it is the rectovaginal septum, which we can see here. This is the rectovaginal septum. And in males, it is the rectovesical septum or the denonvalar fascia, which this is the denonvalar fascia, which is present in males. The lateral rectal ligaments are also facial supports for the rectum. These extend from the posterior lateral pelvic side wall to the rectum and surround the middle rectal arteries. Coming to pelvic diaphragm, this is formed by levator ani muscle and the ischiococcygeus muscles. It is the levator ani further is composed of three muscles, which are the pubococcygeus, iliococcygeus, and puborectalis muscles. 
the function of the pelvic diaphragm is to provide the pelvic floor and maintains the pelvic organs in their proper position uh, this is a coronal t2 weighted mr image here we see this is the iliopsychus muscle and this is the external sphincter the puborectalis muscle is a u shaped sling through rectal junction here we see that this muscle this is the puborectalis muscle which actually surrounds the urethra vagina and the rectum at the level of the inorectal junction functions of puborectalis muscle it maintains the urinary continence by elevating the bladder neck and compressing it against the abscess it also maintains the anal continence when it is contracted but when it is relaxed it allows bowel evacuation coming to levator plate this is actually a posterior condensation of the iliopsychus muscles in the midline to form a raphe which is known as the levator plate it extends from the tip of the coccyx which is here as we can see to the anorectal junction this is important because uh, there's a levator angle which we have to measure with a horizontal reference line and it is about 44.5 uh, degrees in normal females uh, when there is pelvic organ prolapse this this angle increases coming to urogenital diaphragm uh, it consists of deep transverse perineum sphincter urethra compressor urethra muscles and urogenital membrane in male it is traversed by the membranous urethra and deep glossy vein of penis through two separate openings whereas in females it is traversed by the vagina and urethra through a single opening it assists in urethral closure when there is increased intra abdominal pressure and in stabilization of the pelvis during movement coming to perineal body it is actually an ill defined structure of connective tissue and serves as an anchor point for muscles of the pelvic floor and perineum attached in females it is present in the inovaginal septum in this uh, sagittal image we can see that this is the perineal body and in males it is present between the bulb of the penis and the end, and the anus superficial perineal pouch it consists of bulbous spongiosus ischio cavernous superficial transverse perineal muscles it helps to maintain the urinary continence and is important for penile rigidity in males it is vulnerable to traumatic injury which may be due to pelvic fractures and iatrogenic trauma due to surgery coming to anorectal angle it is formed by the central axis of the anal canal and all the posterior wall of the distal rectum so this is important because uh, as we can see during rest uh, the normal anorectal angle is 108 to 127 degrees during squeezing this angle should actually become more acute and during defecation it should become more acute coming to prostatic urethral angle this is the angle formed between the pro uh, proximal and the distal prostatic urethra so if it, this angle is more than 34 degrees in patients with benign prostatic hyperplasia it correlates with the bladder outer obstruction and increased urinary retention coming to anal sphincter it consists of internal and external sphincters so this one is the external sphincter and the uh, more uh, high point is this is the internal sphincter the internal sphincter is actually a continuation of the circular muscle a uh, smooth muscle layer of the rectum whereas the external sphincter is formed by the inferior part of the levator ani puborectalis and the external sphincter muscles internal sphincter is responsible for the involuntary anal continence whereas the external sphincter is responsible for the voluntary anal continence and internal sphincter has autonomous innervations from the sympathetic presacral nerves whereas the external sphincter is innervated by the pudendal nerves coming to dynamic mr imaging of the pelvic floor so patient preparation the patient is instructed to use one rectal enema the night before the examination and another one up to one hour before the examination the bladder should be filled to medium level to prevent the misinterpretation of the imaging results and the distal rectum is filled with 120 to 200 ml of ultrasound gel which is introduced by using a flexible tube and the vagina is filled with 300 to 30 to 60 ml of gel which is introduced by using a syringe the patient position patient is wrapped in an incontinence pad the table is covered with an absorbent towel to minimize discomfort from the eventual loss of urine and or feces and the patient's knees should be slightly bent over a pillow so that the legs are slightly parted and uh, it should not interfere with the organ prolapse especially during the straining and the defecatory phases of the cycle finally uh, t2 weighted uh, images without pad saturation are required for the anatomic evaluation so dynamic examination steady state sequences are performed in the mid sagittal plane and three phases we have to see first is the squeezing phase which uh, in which there is the maximal sphincter contraction then straining which is the valsalva maneuver is performed and then the defecating phase so coming to the squeezing phase this phase is important to determine the strength and integrity of the pelvic floor muscle 
normally the inorectal junction rises 1 to 2 cm from its resting position and the inorectal angle closes during sphincter in the straining phase the competence of the internal and external sphincters is seen and during the defecation phase it is a most important phase and uh, it is for better assessment and more accurate rating of the pelvic organ collapse so mr image interpretation uh, there are few parameters which we have to see on the mr coming to the most important one which is the pubic occipital line this line is drawn from the inferior border of the pubic symphysis last occipital joint and uh, this line we should see in both the rest as well as during the straining phases to assess the uh, prolapse also for uh, seeing the prolapse we have to use a few reference points in each compartment so for the anterior compartment which is the bladder uh, we have to see the posterior uh, posterior posterior and inferior most part of the bladder and a perpendicular line is drawn to the pubo uh, occipital line for the middle compartment the anterior inferior most aspect of the cervix is taken as a reference line and we have to measure the distance from it if the pubo uh, if the patient is a post hysterectomy patient then the posterior superior most aspect of the vaginal vault is seen and in case of the posterior compartment the anterior inferior most aspect of the anorectal junction is used as a reference point thing of pelvic organ prolapse uh, it is actually it follows a rule of 3 for uh, anterior and middle compartment and uh, in rectocele it is less than 2 2 to 4 and more than 4 Coming to the next parameters, which are the H line and the M line. The H line is actually the distance from the inferior border of the symphysis pubis to the posterior anorectal junction on the mid sagittal MR image. This actually represents the anterior posterior width of the levator hiatus, and it measures normally up to five centimeter. And the hiatal enlargement again it can be graded as mild, moderate, or severe. And uh, next one is the M line. This is a perpendicular line which is drawn from the pubic occipital line to the distalmost aspect of the H line. and this uh, is indicative of the distance of the pelvic organs from the in, into the levator hiatus and it measures uh, normally up to 2 cm again the pelvic floor descent can be graded as mild moderate or severe the next parameter is the pubic line this is uh, important because clinically the uh, pelvic organ prolapse is measured at the level of vaginal hymen so this line corresponds to the level of vaginal hymen and it is drawn along the long, long axis of the pubic symphysis coming to a few pathologies in short pelvic floor dysfunction is actually an umbrella term which is used to describe the pelvic function disorders like uh, pelvic organ prolapse and descending perineal syndrome and as already discussed uh, women are more commonly affected and those who are older are more commonly affected and ultimately it decreases the quality so uh, pelvic organ prolapse and pelvic floor relaxation are actually two different terms which need to be differentiated pelvic organ prolapse is abnormal descent of a pelvic organ through the levator hiatus whereas uh, pelvic floor relaxation is excessive portal movement of the pelvic floor at and during straining so pelvic floor relaxation has two components which are hiatal enlargement which we can by uh, increase in the h line and the uh, pelvic floor descent which is in which the m line is elongated coming to the anterior compartment abnormalities which include cystocele and hy urethral hypermobility Cystocele is defined as a descent of the posterior bladder wall or bladder neck by one centimeter below the pubic occipital line. It is caused due to tear or stretching of the pubic cervical fascia or levator ani. Again, as the grading we already, discussed, it can be graded into mild, moderate, severe. So this patient, uh, we there are two sagittal uh, T two eight MR images where we see during rest and during there is cystourethral seal as well appreciated during the straining phase. and also during straining we see there is mild uterine prolapse saddle back sign this is uh, this represents level 2 uh, defect of the level uh, defect in the level 2 support so this is the actual uh, situated image where we see that bilaterally there is loss of the posterior support to the bladder and this results in a saddle back sign coming to middle compartment abnormalities there is uh, it is results in uterine or vaginal wall prolapse with widening of the hiatal area so this uh, these images are in uh, are situated sagittal images in a 55 year old woman with the uh, perineal bulging and uh, we can see that during the straining phase there is uterine prolapse which is uh, moderate to severe and also there is mild uh, cystocele This is a post hysterectomy patient uh, with presented with pelvic organ prolapse 
again these images are during rest and during straining so during straining image we see that there is complete prolapse of the vaginal wall, uh, walls as we can see in this by this arrow head with eversion of the vaginal walls also we can appreciate that uh, there is herniation of the peritoneal fat along with few bowel loops so there is also a large enterocele in this patient coming to posterior compartment abnormalities the most common abnormality is the anterior ectro lateral and posterior are also uh, abnormalities but they are less common and rectocele is defined as anterior bulging of the anterior rectal wall due to weakness of the rectovaginal or rectovesical fascia and it can be graded as uh, mild moderate severe it is a little different from the anterior and middle compartments so these are sagittal or uh, tituated mr images in an uh, aged patient uh, the patient uh, presents with uh, rectal prolapse and he was also also treated with rectopexy so here we see that there is erorectal uh, descent and uh, on during the straining phase there is small rectocele in this patient which is uh, about 1 cm also uh, important thing to note is the prostate is lying below the pubococcygeal line rectal intersusception and prolapse it is the infolding of rectal wall due to proning or facial disruption it may be partial thickness or full thickness the so rectal intersusception can again be intrarectal it can be intraanal or it can be extraanal coming to fecal incontinence it is continuous or recurrent passage of fecal fecal material more than 10 for at least one month in a person older than 3 to 4 years so here we see that this is an actual tituated mr image so we see that on the here the right external sphincter is thinned out as compared to the left which is normal also the internal sphincter is normal coming to transperineal hernia these appear as defects in the pelvic diaphragm which are best seen when the patient is bearing down and may contain intrapelvic fat or other pelvic contents so these are coronal and axial uh, the coronal and sagittal mr images where uh, these are performed during the straining phase so we see that the left iliopsoas muscle is completely thinned out and there is small fat herniation seen so this is transperineal hernia coming to descending perineal syndrome so this uh, for descending perineal syndrome important parameters are m line and h line which we already discussed should be more than 2 cm and 5 cm respectively here uh, this is a sagittal tituated mr image there we see that there is a cysto uh, urethrocele with the bladder base lying which is marked by b lying well below the pubococcygeal line also there is bladder outlet obstruction in this patient because there is a uh, uterine prolapse and the prolapsed uterus is compressing upon the bladder outlet so this resulted in the uh, bladder outlet obstruction coming to anismus or spastic pelvic floor disorder this is uh, a paradoxical contraction of the pubo rectalis which already was mentioned in the earlier presentation uh, and uh, it is uh, during uh, straining and defecation so dynamic mr is a good method to uh, see the anismus because uh, normally the angle should decrease to acute angle during the defecation phase but here as we see the angle has not decreased due to the persistent contraction of the pubo rectalis muscle and in the actual tituated mr image we see that the muscle is thickened and contracted during the uh, active phase so there are a few important things which should be mentioned in the radiologist's mr report firstly we should mention about the measurements the h line the m line and the levator plate angulation at rest and during defecation group then the organ prolapse if there is any should be mentioned based on the location whether it is in the anterior middle uh, posterior compartment or in the pelvic sac and it should be graded according to the uh, measurement also if any content is visible we should mention that in the report next like anismus or puborectal muscle contraction should be seen and it should be reported then uh, there is any pelvic floor relaxation if it is present we should see that and we should grade that and mention it finally if there is any defect in the supporting structures like iliopsoas puborectalis muscle ligament fascia or anal sphincter the type and site of defect should also be reported so to conclude pelvic floor disorders are uh, affect a large num large number of women and increases with age thorough knowledge of the pelvic anatomy and careful evaluation of all pelvic compartments are crucial for clinical counseling and surgical planning physical examination has limited diagnostic value especially in complex cases and transcranial ultrasound and dynamic mr imaging of the pelvic floor enable comprehensive non invasive evaluation of the pelvic floor these are my references
Thank you, Dr. Ishani, for a beautiful presentation. So, <laughs> the assessment and treatment of women with pelvic floor weakness requires a multidisciplinary team for like radiologists for diagnosis and urologists and gynecologists for treatment. There is some part of surgery also in endoscopies and uh, psychological therapy is also sometimes needed. So very good presentation. Okay, now it is open for discussion. Any question from any audience? Anybody has question can please ask for ma'am and our respected honorable speakers. Chatting ma'am and Satabdi ma'am. Anybody has a question can ask. Ma'am, uh, one question is there. While doing the pelvic floor analysis, whether the uh, for USG, whether the bladder need to be fully empty or partially empty. Uh, during ultrasound, the bladder should be fully empty, but an MRI, the bladder should be uh, partly full, not fully empty or not fully uh, distended, because it will cause uh, mass effect on the other organs. It's different for ultrasound and MRI. Ma'am, how you suggest uh, this pelvic floor, you know, uh, for female uh, to understand how to, you know, uh, means identify whether the pelvic floor has any dysfunction. What you give your suggestion? For pelvic floor, uh, we have two uh, parts, the pelvic organ prolapse, for which in MRI is the pubic oxygen line, and for ultrasound, it is the horizontal reference line from the pubic symphysis to anorectal junction. We measure the distance perpendicular to it for the respective uh, compartments for anterior, middle, and posterior. While for uh, pelvic floor relaxation and MRI, we see the H line and the M line. For H line, it is the measurement of the levator hiatus should be more than five centimeter. And for M line, for the pelvic organ distant, this distance should be more than two centimeter. So if anybody don't, uh, doesn't have any question, we can go ahead and uh, thank you, well, Dr. Ishani, Dr. Satabdi ma'am for, you know, it's such an insightful uh, presentation and explanation of the, this complex anatomy book nicely. And the techniques you have explained, you know, it's very easy to understand for me also uh, becoming an engineer also, I have understood, you know, a lot of things I learned from you and thank you, Parul ma'am, for organizing such a good and extensive, you know, learning session where uh, like engineer like me can understand these complex uh, structures very easily. So thank you so much uh, for all of you and all the delegates who have participated. Any more further question, you can you know, drop it in the chat box in the Facebook link, in a YouTube link. And you know, we can, you know, travel the, uh, pass these questions to our panelists. Now, Mr. Sandeep Maiti, our regional sales head is also joined, want to thank you all and do the validity speech. Uh, thank you, Gosani. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, basically, on behalf of Mindray India, I would like to express our hearty thanks to respected all speakers and all attendees. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Parul Ma'am, uh, Dr. Kalita, and Dr. Shukla Ma'am for this excellent session. Uh, thanks for giving a great insight to the very interesting subject like this pelvic floor imaging. I'm sure all the attendees will be looking forward to your upcoming session. Uh, definitely they will be looking for. Uh, so see you soon and meeting you personally and be safe to all. And thank you once again. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. One question is coming. Uh, Ma'am, how to differentiate the rectoanal versus rectorenal interception? So we have to see the level of the interception. Well, like uh, in recto rectal, it will be in the rectum, and in the recto it will come uh, further down, like below the inorectal junction, which is about five centimeter from the anal walls. So, 
So we can wrap up the session now. I think the answer is already given by the presenters. Ma'am, you like to say something? Yes. Okay. We can conclude it now. Okay, yes. Thank so thank you so much. Namaskar to all and take care. Be safe in this uh, Corona era and let's hope we'll meet again in a, with the upcoming new learning session. Thank you so much to all. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you, Gosh. Thank you, everyone. The time when we choose this path, we are all ready to take a leap into the unknown. We embarked on our journey since 1991. For these 30 years, we are down to earth and forge ahead with our initial intention of bringing better healthcare for all. During turbulent times, we adhere to innovation as always. Along the way, we stay close to our customers going deep to the front line to achieve continuous breakthroughs. From a single product to the completed solution. From patient monitoring and life support to in vitro diagnostics and medical imaging and so on. From primary medical institutions to top-notch teaching hospitals. From one lane focus to diversification. From a startup to a global company. Thirty years on, we never stop innovating ourselves. Together with our global partners to face challenges and celebrate success. At the age of 30, we are ready to take on new challenges with our original heart and will. We will be always striving to develop and share technologies. Creating customer value with comprehensive solutions and broad portfolio. With the aim of providing better care for more people and making healthcare within reach. Our mission lies not only in the past, but more in the future.